hair is the ultimate accessory. It's so much of our identity, uh, whether you're a man or a woman, and when you're not able to express yourself in that way, it's painful. Everyone they ask says, you're fine, your hair looks great. But the, the person knows it's not fine, something's wrong. They go to their doctor, the doctor says, you look okay. Um, it'll come back. And so these early stages are frustrating for patients. Before we jump to treatment or what can be done, you have to figure out what's underlying the hair loss so that then we can properly create a path to ideally recovering some of the hair. Is it the kind of hair loss we can expect is going to recover on its own or might there be other things we need to dive deeper into? From the Zoomerplex in historic Liberty Village, The Zoomer with Libby Snymer. Welcome to The Zoomer, I'm Libby Snymer. It's a condition many people mistakenly believe only happens to men, hair loss. But the truth is at least 40% of women will suffer some form of it by the time they reach 40. For women, hair thinning or loss can be devastating, particularly since our hair is often entangled with our identity. On today's show, the real root of the problem in women plus what we can do to mitigate or treat hair loss. But before we dive in, let's tee up the topic. Yes, women experience hair loss too. Up to 100 hairs a day. While new ones generally grow in their place, a variety of factors, including illness, genetics, and nutrition, can disrupt a growth cycle. An estimated 40% of women suffer from hair loss by the time they're 40 years old. And research shows that people suffering often wait until 50% of their hair is gone before seeking treatment. Nevertheless, very few of us want to talk about it. Which is why today we're getting to the root of it. And never mind talking about it, many women don't even recognize and acknowledge it. So at what point do most women seek some kind of professional help? Dr. Salzberg. You know what, it varies a lot and some people have it on their radar, but there's a large proportion of women who feel that this is, as it said, more of an issue with men and aren't necessarily looking for it as they get older in the same way that men might be. So. You know, depending, we'll talk about different stages of life and when different types of hair loss can happen, but it's true, as it said, some women can be quite far along in terms of their hair loss before they realize it's something they should be speaking to their doctor about. Candice, when did that happen for you? I, I was, uh, as a young child, always had thin hair. I could never wear a ponytail. It was just always thin. And um, as I got into uh, my early 20s and 30s, I would have uh, friends and family mention that, wow, your hair is getting really thin. And by the time I was 30s, I started asking my doctor about whether I had hypothyroidism because I felt like I had a lot of the symptoms. But I was kind of fluffed off and know you're within the range. So I uh, struggled with hair loss and not being able to find the right diagnosis for years. Michael, as a hair professional, um, what do you find? I think it happens, uh, it, it's so traumatic because yes, it's supposed to happen to men, it's not supposed to happen to women. And so there's a lot of denial that goes into it. And when women finally come to see me with their hair loss, uh, it's because they can't cover it anymore. Um, and they're, they're, they can't have any coverage without really compromising the style that they want to have. Because basically, that's what it is. Hair is the ultimate accessory. It's so much of our identity, uh, whether you're a man or a woman. And when you're not able to express yourself in that way, it's painful. So that's when they usually come to see me is when it just gets to the point where they can't, they can't do it anymore. Dr. Donovan, what is your experience? Well, you know, Libby, um, temporary hair loss is quite common in women. And, you know, many women feel when they start losing hair that hair is eventually going to come back. Um, women are much more likely to have this temporary hair loss. And so that goes into some of the waiting that, that happens and, and the delay. And then when women find that it's just not coming back, uh, you know, that's often when they, they seek help and seek treatment. But uh, I'm so glad you're having this topic on because it really is, you know, underreported. I had 
temporary hair loss twice. Uh, and then after that, it really took me a long time to realize, hey, this isn't temporary. I mean, I've had uh, the first chemo I had for breast cancer, I went completely bald. And then the second chemo that I had for pancreatic cancer, it thinned. But it, it took a while to realize, mm, no, this is, you know, this is, this is it. Well, that's the part of it as well. There's many different factors that can play into why a woman may lose her hair. And so depending on the time of life, the stage of life, the circumstances, other medical stuff going on, it can take time for dialing into a diagnosis. And, you know, some degrees of hair loss, a woman might not notice, like we said, till much later. So as Dr. Donovan was mentioning, you know, after pregnancy, it's quite common for women to have this period of time where their hair thins out quite significantly. So later in life, when they experience that thinning again, they may kind of relate it to something that had happened previously when it may actually be something quite different. Right, and even uh, weight loss can trigger hair loss. Yeah, it sure can. We have weight loss, we have thyroid abnormalities, we have low iron, stress. Um, these are all causes of this temporary hair loss. And these early stages of hair thinning are so frustrating because women notice that the hair is thinner. And it takes 50% of loss before it's noticeable to someone else. But women often notice very early on that something's just not right. The ponytail's not the same size. It just doesn't feel the same. And everyone they ask says, you're fine. Your hair looks great. But the, the person knows it's not fine. Something's wrong. They go to their doctor. The doctor says, you look OK. Um, it'll come back. And so these early stages are frustrating for patients. And uh, what I see a lot of, and I assume that a lot of the women I see it on don't even realize is like suddenly their part is getting really wider. big. Yeah, it starts to get wider and everything. Now, then they get into uh, um, a dilemma because then they're afraid of doing something that isn't going to look right or make too much of a change that people notice. And so they can delay that even further. And as their part widens and widens, the, the, um, the change becomes more noticeable. And of course, it's much more noticeable to them rather than to people watching. So yeah, they're in a, they're in a little bit of a, a bind because the longer they leave it, the more scared they are of doing something that could give them a positive look because of the change. Okay, we need to take a short break. We'll be right back with more of the Zoomer. Welcome back. Take a look at a picture taken by a professional photographer at a gala event I attended in June 2019. So this is where the penny dropped for me. For years, hair and makeup artists had been telling me, I have a cowlick, and they had to work around it. Well, that is some cowlick. It's a bald spot, and it looked terrible. And as I said, I had been through both complete hair loss and hair thinning with two courses of chemotherapy, but that was years ago. Other causes range from chronic stress to underlying illnesses and genetics. And recently I heard of cases of hair loss after COVID. It can also happen as part of the natural aging process. So when I realized mine was permanent, I decided to do something about it. So what should women do to figure out the cause of their hair loss? That's the exact right first question. So before we jump to treatment or what can be done, you have to figure out what's underlying the hair loss so that then we can properly create a path to ideally recovering some of the hair. And so everything you mentioned is a potential risk factor for hair loss. So as Dr. Donovan was mentioning, the more temporary hair loss that can occur generally whenever there's some sort of a stressful event. And that might look like anything. We mentioned pregnancy before, you mentioned COVID. So even people who are getting viral illnesses are kind of unwell or hospitalized for a surgery. Generally, the hair loss will be delayed by a couple of months after whatever that kind of traumatic event was. And that type of hair loss is pretty temporary and will often recover over time. So you wanna kind of figure out, is it the kind of hair loss we can expect is going to recover on its own or might there be other things we need to dive deeper into? So to oftentimes the doctor will order some blood tests and look to see, is there something, you mentioned thyroid before, is there something kind of underlying that might be correctable otherwise medically? 
or is this what we can kind of attribute more to just that typical, what we call androgenetic alopecia hair loss that tends to come with age, what we would classically have referred to as male pattern, but certainly happens to females as well. And there's a difference between male pattern and female pattern. So where on the head does female pattern baldness occur? Female pattern hair loss often occurs in the center of the scalp. And you're right, Libby, it's, it's very different looking than in males. And that, of course, leads to some of the confusion and delay. Males often develop hair loss in the temples and in the crown or the back. Uh, but in women, it's the center of the scalp. The part becomes wider, it becomes a little more see-through, and so the pattern is different. Hmm. Candice, uh, for you, what was it like to deal with this? I, I got to a point socially that I, I started uh, becoming introvert and would almost panic when friends would call me and ask me maybe to go out for dinner. I would start to worry about what I would be wearing. Uh, would it be appropriate to wear a hat? Most uh, styles don't really look good with hats. Uh, it's certainly at, le at that time of my life, I mean, that was about 20 years ago now. I'm si gonna be 62 in May, so I've been living with thinning hair, for, thank you, thinning hair for a very long time. So there was this uh, panic that would occur. It would, it would just, like I'd get that shiver up and down my spine, that uh, uh, the worry would set in, I would have sleepless nights, I would be, all consuming about my hair loss. And I, um, I started going to, and trying on uh, synthetic wigs and they were not uh, comfortable. And I didn't feel it represented me when I looked in the mirror. And so I was losing my identity as I was losing my hair. That's, that's terrible. Were you able to figure out exactly what the root cause was for you? I, I finally was able to uh, speak to a thyroid specialist and he didn't even look at my blood work and, and look, just took a look at me and, and through the puffiness of my face and uh, the thinness of my hair, he immediately said I had hypothyroidism. And through about six months of treatment, I was able to feel better and I started losing weight, but he did suggest that the hair loss would have not been recoverable at that time because I'd left it too long. Hmm. And do your clients come to you after they know what caused their hair loss? Um, sometimes yes, sometimes no. A lot of a lot of times I I play I play goalie on Tuesday nights and I see this as being the last line of defense because so many women will see their doctor, will see their dermatologist, will will go through a lot of things and when they've tried everything else, then they come to see me. Um, I see, I say, I've said it before, I see a thousand women a year that don't want to see me um, because of course they're having such a hard time with their hair. But they come to see me and it is life-changing when they finally get the look that they want with their hair, the number of times they've said, it, it changed my life, I wish I did it sooner, that sort of thing, um, because it is so important and they've been going through such a traumatic time and I'm sure, the doctors here have seen that happen as well with how you've treated uh, women. They're so relieved that they get the look with the hair that they want to have uh, back again. Um, it really is something that, that is uh, uh, momentous in their lives. Is, is this something that you've seen lead to depression or anxiety? It can have a huge impact. And that's the piece that, you know, we think about our hair, but it plays into so much of our identity. And as you said, it's the ultimate accessory where, you know, and when you're used to it, looking a certain way, feeling a certain way, it provides a little bit of armor for us. You almost can start to feel a little bit naked when you don't have as much. So it can absolutely have significant implications personally, socially, emotionally. Yeah. Dr. Donovan, I, I've seen videos of people uh, on, on the internet specifically related to COVID and they're saying oh my god is this a result of long COVID or I had no idea this this could happen do you have any I know it's early but do you have any sense yet is that one of those temporary things from a stressful event or is that something that they might have to deal with on a permanent basis it seems to be a temporary event so far. About 20% to even 50% of people that have COVID-19 infection 
will have this temporary hair loss. And so the numbers are just astronomical. Um, but we think that it is temporary and most people will get the hair back. Uh, but it can take six to nine months or even a year before it fully returns to what it once was. And is that the normal trajectory for temporary hair loss? That's pretty normal. Yeah, that three month uh, window before it starts is pretty common. So if you have COVID infection in February, you start losing hair three months later, and then it takes six to nine months before you're back to, to getting back to where you were. Okay, that sounds like a long time. That's part of the problem is anything, once, even once the cause of hair loss is determined and we can, whether it's reversible or we get kind of things turning around from a treatment perspective, I tell my patients, what, like hair growth is like watching paint dry. It's not gonna be quick and it's gonna come so slowly that you're not gonna even really notice the changes incrementally until time passes and you can look back between you know, a year apart and see that actually change has taken place. Okay, don't go away, we'll be right back. Welcome back. Depending on the underlying cause, there may be things you can do to prevent or slow hair loss. In some instances, women may benefit from a medication like minoxidil, commonly known as Rogaine. And a newer but very expensive option is platelet-rich plasma or PRP injections. So what do you recommend and how do you use these things? Dr. Salzberg, you've got some... I have uh, some goodies. You have some goodies, and they're available over the counter. Yes, absolutely. So again, once we've kind of figured out what the cause of hair loss is, we can talk about some treatment options. A common one that will often be initially recommended as a starting uh, would be the minoxidil foam. So this is the formulation for women, and it's fairly easy to use. It's meant to be used daily at home. And so what we would do is remove the cap. The dosage would be half of the cap full. Oh, here we go. So you invert it. It's very similar to hair mousse, and that's what I tell my patients. It comes out similar to as a typical hair mousse would. Once a day, half a cap is pretty typical for women. And then... Daria, you want to come over? Uh, our, <laughs> the idea is to apply the medication where you're most noting the thinning. So we would kind of part the hair. And as we were saying previously, for women, the more typical would be that thickening of the hair part is where you're going to start to notice the change is happening. And then we're going to take the foam like a hair mousse and apply it. It's not for the hair, but it's for the scalp. So you're going to apply it to the center part and then wherever the thinning is noted kind of along the edges of the part and then it very quickly kind of dries into the scalp. So a common question that people will have is, is this gonna be something that's gonna impact my hairstyle? Am I gonna feel like my hair's greasy from it? Thank you so much. Most patients do not notice that to be the case. It's pretty easy to use, but you have to be using it for quite some time before you're gonna notice any real change. Your, your technique is a lot better than mine because it makes a big mess when I use the foam. It can, and then that's the thing. You wanna just wash your hands afterwards, make sure it's not getting onto other facial sites or areas where you don't want it because it can cause Cause hair growth to sites where we don't necessarily want the hair to grow and uh, otherwise it's just being patient about it because it takes time and uh, you also have the liquid form so this is the it. yeah so if you didn't want to use it in the kind of foam or hair mousse it comes in a solution as well so has more of like a, a bottle dropper it's more liquidy it comes down sometimes to patient preference in terms of uh, wanting to use the more foamy versus the more liquidy well i i uh, prefer the liquid and it says it's for men only uh, the box, that's a, that's a kind of no-name brand. Yeah, same, the same active ingredient, though. And it, it has three applicators, which I find completely useless. And so I use a little dropper, and, and I make less of a mess than yeah. with the foam. And yeah. it's cheaper. Yeah. As are so many things. What are, what, uh, this is the first I heard, though, of PRP injections. So PRP is platelet-rich plasma. That's a newer treatment, and it involves taking a person's blood and spinning it down in a centrifuge or a fancy machine which rotates very quickly, and what comes out of the machine is a person's plasma. And so this can be injected into the patient's scalp 
and this can stimulate hair growth in some individuals. And so in the present day, we have minoxidil as an option, we have platelet-rich plasma as an option, we have anti-androgen or male hormone blocking medications, and we have lasers. And so our array of treatments is expanding ever yet. I have some more questions about the PRP injections. So first of all, are there trials? Is there evidence that they work? There's some evidence. So it's, it's, I'd say on the earlier side still of where we're at in terms of that as a treatment option, it's newer than some of the things that we've had, like the Rogaine. Um, you know, it's initially most looked at in male patients. So that's where we have the most robust data to support its use, but it's being studied in other things as well, including in women. And so, you know, some patients really do benefit from it. It's not going to work perfectly for everyone. And more and more data is coming out over time. And, and can I get a sense of how it's, I think it's really expensive, like thousands. It's expensive. Yeah. Yeah. I, I know it's also used, uh, um, for my friends for knees and things and it it does not always work for that either yeah yeah uh so what about there there are some brands that there's tons of this stuff out there and there are some brands that claim to be natural what about those supplements you mean or i don't know what they are there's something called Viv viviscal that i see next to the minoxidil in the drugstore and uh, i looked at it once and it said it was natural something or other what does Dr. Donovan think? I know what I think about those, but I'm curious what he has to say. You know, there's all these supplements that are, are available. And what's surprising is for some of them, there is a little bit of data behind them that they can be helpful for some people. And so with hair loss, I'll often say to patients that let's look at all the options. Let's choose what feels right for you but let's cap it at six months of trying. And if you find after six months, you've got the outcome you so wanted, great, we've got the plan. But if you didn't, let's stop at six months, reevaluate, and let's get started on something else right away. And so these supplements may work. They don't tend to be as effective as some of the other options you spoke of earlier. And the other thing about the minoxidil is you have to keep using it. If you stop using it, <laughs> your hair is going along with it. Yeah. And that's kind of, as he was alluding to, is that, you know, it can take time to find the right cocktail of things that's, that are going to work best for any individual. And once you've found that, you've got to stick with it because anything that is working for you, if you stop, it's not like you're going to lose your hair overnight, but slowly you're going to revert back to where you otherwise would be. So once you found that mixture of things that are working to help you regrow, then you've really got to stick with it to continue to maintain that benefit. Candice, have you used any of these things? I have. Uh, however, I was to a point where my hair was so thin, I had to choose, I was a single mother at the time. And so um, I, I, I don't know what the price of, of this would be at this time, but at, I would say it was around $100 a month. And I got to a point where I had to justify the $1,200 for the treatment of the minoxidil or putting that towards a budget of a human hair wig. And as I uh, went into the, the, the more aggressive thinning as I, I, I chose the, uh, the nicer looking wig. That's right, none of these options is cheap. Unfortunately it's, not. It's... Most of them are definitely come with a cost associated. Okay, we'll be right back with more of the Zoomer. Welcome back. When medical treatments fall short, women can also turn to cosmetic options to cover for lost hair, such as color spray or hair building fibers or hair toppers. Hair stylist Richard Jastrzewski joins me now for how to disguise light to moderate thinning hair and scalp and show through uh, scalp. And joining him is my colleague Daria Ivankovic. Hey, Libby. Hey. Hi, Libby. And Daria, you lost some hair when you lost weight. I did. In about 2016, I lost about 60 pounds in six months. And with that, I felt like I lost 60% of my hair. Um, I guess it was the calorie, lack of calorie intake. I started noticing it up here 
kind of just thinning out here. I noticed it took me half the time to straighten my hair to blow dry it. And it was kind of getting scary at one point. So it spooked me a bit. Take it away, Richard. That's a common cause uh, for that kind of hair loss and an easy way to help camouflage this, especially if it's not a point where you actually need to do something more severe, is something like Topic. It's just a fiber powder that has color that comes in a range of colors. And all you need to do is take the hair away from where you want to work. And it's got this little puffer tops. And when you first get the packaging, you're going to have to take the interior shaker top. It looks like, like a powdered sugar screen. Take that off, and then this puffer will screw onto the lid. And then you're going to just do some light puffs. And depending on how heavy handed you are, it will create wow. depth at the scalp. Wow. Whoa. And fill in so that it looks like you have more hair there. Now, Daria could easily get a lot, get along with this medium brown because it'll help accentuate her blonde, make the blonde look blonder and give her kind of like a balayage look. So even though that's underneath, you can see from the front, it looks like she's got more hair there. You can see on screen. And then also, just saying about with that, uh, that show through in the part area, like Libby had in her picture, we can do the same thing. So you just kind of open that part Wow. And go through and spray it in. Kind of use your comb to tap it. And this is purely cosmetic, purely temporary. It'll come out with the first shampoo, and you'll set it with, you have the little bottle of their fixing spray. It'll help set it down into place. Make sure you get it wherever you've sprayed it. And there, it looks like she's got thicker, fuller hair. It does. Magic I hope you're going bottle. out tonight, darling. Wow, you're coming home with me. <laughs> Just saying. Deal. That looks great. Thank you, Richard. You're very welcome. Thank you, Daria. Thanks, Livy. Really looks good. Thank you. For women with moderate to severe hair loss, Michael Suba, president of Continental Hair, specializes in helping women to cover with toppers and wigs. And joining him is his client, Candace Hamilton. Thank you. Good to be here. Take it away. Now, Candace has uh, more severe hair loss. Um, so you started out wearing toppers first. Yes. And now you're wearing a full wig. Yes, I am. Uh, I'm going to show a topper here. I'm going to bring one of these out here. This is something, because female pattern thinning is mostly at the top and front, we have something like this. It's very light, just a little bit, a little bit more. Um, goes on with these little clips that can be put on and off very easily. And... It's very easy, very light, and very natural. Now, I'm going to take this one off, and we'll put your favorite one on, the pink one, which you wear a lot. Here we go. And I'm going to let you put it on because you're more used to it than I am. See, the three things that you need with a wig or with anything it has to be, of course, a natural look. It has to fit properly and be comfortable. It has to be secure. Here we go. There we are. So, yeah, it gives her the look that she wants, and she swaps them out back and forth. I love that. <laughs> that looks Isn't great. It great? I, right, and I don't normally like uh, weird colors of hair. <laughs> oh. I love it, too. It's a fashion pink, and it just makes me happy. Uh-huh, and uh, it's easier than having to style your hair every day. Well, yes, I, I certainly would take hair over this, but... Uh... It's a great uh, um, choice if, if you're having thin hair like myself, yes, for sure. Are you still able to use toppers? I, if I grew out the top of my hair, I, I, I can wear toppers. I find them a little cooler in the hot dead of the, the summer. But right now, I just, I just took the top of the hair off because it's more comfortable under my wig. I do keep the, my hair framed around my face and in the back. So if the wind blows my wig, it, 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 that's my hair here. Mm -hmm. And so it just naturally goes in with the wig. So if you have complete alopecia areata, 
to terrorists, then you don't, you don't have that extra framing of the hair. But Do you ever not wear your wig? Never. I, I take my wig off at night, but uh, no. no. And do you ever wear... Turbans. Um, yeah, if my, my guy and I are in the convertible and I'll go do the Jackie O look with sunglasses and a turban and scarves, which uh, I have women that will actually comment when I'm on the beach wearing my turbans and my hats, how uh, styling I am. They don't realize I'm doing it because I don't have my wig on. <laughs> what about playing sports? Well, it depends on the sport, of course, and how aggressive you're going to be. Now, there are different uh, types of attachments, like um, this, of course, a wig is basically a hat with hair, or um, a topper is with the clips. There are other systems, like the one I'm wearing, which is glued down. So I play hockey, and, and, and my clients will go swimming and go to the gym and I not have any worries about that. Um, you get to know what you can and can't do very quickly. And you learn to trust it uh, uh, and, and, and know where you can go and where you can't. I, I remember when I, w when I was on chemo, I, would, I think I took the wig off when I was playing, uh, but that was partly because the, the bald head used to <laughs> intimidate my opponents <laughs> in an odd way. <laughs> uh, so, um, and would you ever consider just... I, there was a time when I actually shaved my hair I thought I would add more vibrant makeup, wear big earrings and wear colorful clothes. And I really embraced it because I wanted to love and embrace myself and who I was. And the problem was I had a lot of people looking at me like I was uh, recovering from cancer. Yeah. And they were giving me this sad puppy dog look all the time. And it was, it was really, I had, years later I had people saying, oh, I see you have recovered from your, your cancer. And it was like, no, I never had cancer. Uh, it's, thinning hair or alopecia or it's uh, hypothyroidism. So there's a disconnect, definitely. So in, even it's funny with the in, uh, influencers, the ones that have completely no hair, they really rock it. They're very brave and they're, they're showing themselves with their beautiful bald heads. But when you have thinning hair and it's sparse, there, there really is that middle ground that you're, you're just not either. Well, yeah, I know, and I know with men who have little bits of hair, they often end up looking better if they just shave the whole thing off. Mm -hmm. What about the majority of your clients? Do any of them say, okay, well, I, I want to have a wig, but, you know, sometimes I'm just going to go au naturel? It's uh, having hair, I've found with my clients, is very addictive. Um, there's uh, clients that won't... Uh, get the newspaper off the porch without putting uh, their system or their, their, their topper or something on. Uh, they like the look, it becomes their identity and they stick with it. Uh, they're not, uh, they're not going to let go. Okay, thank you both so much and thank you for doing this, really appreciate it. You're welcome, thank you for having us. Okay. There's more after the break, don't go away. Welcome back. Let's check in with our audience, our very large audience, for some of their questions, beginning with Rita. Hi, Rita. Hi, I'm Rita. Um, I'm just wondering, is hair loss at all a trait, a genetic trait? Because sometimes they say men, it depends on if the, the mother's father lost their hair, then the son might lose their hair. Is, is that true with women as well? That's a really good question. And so, yes, there's definitely a genetic component to hair loss. It's not always the whole story, but it can certainly be a piece of the puzzle. And it's funny because that people really, for whatever reason, that's very ingrained, that concept of it's your mother's father, like look to that particular individual. That's not necessarily the whole story. So, yes, it can be genetic, but it's not keyed to one individual in your life that you can watch for potential hair loss. Oh, in my family, we always blame my mother. It can be men, women, like, so it's really any family members. If you have a significant amount of family members that are noticing thinning with age, that puts you at higher risk. It's not so much to one particular person in your family. Our next question is from Connie. Hi, Connie. Hi there. Um, I wanted to know uh, where I could buy a wig, a good wig in Ottawa. This is something that I tell my clients that come to see me uh, and what it's going to be like. And I'll give you uh, the advice I give them, Connie, is think of it like you're shopping. Uh, that, that has a resonance with a lot of people. Uh, 
take a look around, get, get an idea of the look that you want to have, have an idea of the, your price range, and go shopping. Go to these people, talk to them, see if they're, they're attuned to what you want to have done. Um, try things on, absolutely. Try things on, play with them, and see, bring a friend or not. It depends on, on where you want to be. But um, take a look at it as though you're, you're shopping for a look um, and you want to try things out and go to several places. And don't feel pressured at all, um, but just basically get, uh, uh, get the information that you think is going to give you the best uh, decision. Don't be pressured. Think about it, come back, and then decide on what you want to do. I have a question. Now with glasses and hairstyles and makeup, you can you can try things on virtually. Is there anything like that for a wig? There's some um, there's some uh, uh, computer programs. I haven't seen anything that I've really really liked, um, but it's really it's difficult. And a lot of times I get questions or calls every every other day from someone that's bought something online and they're frustrated because it's not working, it's not the right color, it's too much hair, it's this, that, and they, they, they call and ask me if I can fix it, and it really is difficult to do um, because you're starting with something that wasn't right in the first place, and you're trying to do it. So if in any time you're able to actually go somewhere and uh, try these things on and see what it's like, whether it's a topper or a full wig, um, you should try and do that first. Absolutely, fit is primary. Uh, it, the look of a wig is is absolutely important, but it's like a, a great shirt. You get it on sale. It's uh, it's gorgeous. You love it. It's not great. It's not fitting you. You're not going to wear it. It's going to stay in the closet. And so you really have to have a really good consultation. And wherever you live, uh, they're going to do it for free. You're going to go in, book an appointment. They're going to sit down. And they're, these are women or men that are going to you're going to want to develop a relationship with. So uh, it's not going to be going in once and buying something and then never to return. You want a, uh, a relationship. They're going to be washing it for you. you they may style it for you. Uh, you may have years and years going in and developing a, a relationship with these people. So make sure it's a comfortable relationship. How often do you have your wig washed and styled? Well, I have a plethora of wigs, <laughs> and uh, I have a virtual business, and everybody knows that Candace wears wigs. So uh, when I go on a, a live, they're always wondering what wig I'm wearing that day. So for me, I think I have seven. So it just depends on the, the, what the outfit I'm wearing and what I want to wear that day, and it's my mood. So I kind of have celebrated wearing a wig now. Uh, before, I used to just one wear one wig, and nobody knew anything, and it was a one, one thing. But... Rule, of, rule of thumb, I think, for washing and, and setting a wig would be once every three to five weeks. And people will, will it's getting your hair done, so they can either do it themselves or, yeah. Yeah, for sure, four weeks. Like getting your hair cut, getting your hair done. cut and colored. Yeah, that's right. Our next question comes from Marsha. Hello, Marsha. Hello. Uh, I am interested in the Minoxidil. I am currently using something else called Nepotide. I don't know if you've ever heard of that or not. But I guess with any of these products, you, you do have to keep using them forever or else they're, they're, your hair loss is going to start up again. Is that right? Doctor? So you're gonna to need to use it. Whatever it is, if it's working, you need to be consistent with it over time. And if you were to stop using it, it's not like your hair is gonna fall out right away, but over time you'll notice it'll start to thin and ultimately get to where you would have been had you never used the product. Okay, thank you. No problem. How long does that take? I think it varies from individual to individual, but over a course of months off of medication, the hair is gonna kind of you know, settle where it would otherwise be. Because. I uh, would prefer not to take that stuff on vacation. Uh, if, if I stop it for a week or two, is that going to make any difference? Short period of time is not going to be as significant or noticeable, but longer period, months on end of not using it, you're going to start to see the difference. Right, but for 10 days, no difference or a little difference? My sense is going to be to say little difference that you'll actually notice if you pick right back up using it once you're back. Okay, when we come back, final thoughts from our panelists. That's next.
Welcome back to The Zoomer. It's now time for final thoughts from our panelists, starting with Dr. Donovan. You know, my final thoughts are that there are so many options for hair loss, but the first step is to get the right diagnosis. And until you have the right diagnosis, you really can't pair it with the right treatment. And then the second thought is, let's, let's get talking about this important subject. And thanks for you know, hosting and, and talking about this subject, because we really need to do a better job as a community talking about women's hair loss. Dr. Salzberg. I completely agree. I think it's something that a lot of women kind of deal with in silence. It's not something that many people will speak about with their family members or their girlfriends in the way they would maybe think to speak about other things. So normalize it, talk about it. And if it's something that's on your mind, seek some help and treatment. Absolutely agree with that. And if you are the friend or the family member that is on the other side of it, please don't say, oh, it's only hair, or uh, I really want you to just be quiet and listen to the, what they have to say and encourage them to move in the direction they need and support them on that. I think that uh, what, what I would say is don't panic. There's all sorts of options on the medical side, on the cosmetic side, on, on um, all sorts of ways that someone can go, a woman can go to get the, the look that, that she wants to have. Uh, and not to be frustrated uh, or, or allow uh, to get herself to get discouraged. Uh, but basically, yes, go talk to uh, your doctor, your dermatologist, get uh, a good idea of what, uh, what's going on, and then see what works best for you. For many of us, our hair is a big part of our self-image, and whether you choose medicine or cosmetics, you can do something about it. Thank you so much to our panelists, and thank you to the audience for being with us. We'll see you soon. It's time to Zoom out.